One of Jesus' closest disciples was John. In fact, he describes himself as a disciple whom Jesus loved. And there's something a lot that we can learn from John's testimony. In John 17, John records Jesus' as a prayer where Jesus prays for himself, he prays for his immediate disciples, and then he prayed for all those who'd believe on account of their testimony. And now some 2,000 years removed from that, you and I are those who pour over the scriptures to try to understand and to live and to correctly interpret the will of God, the purpose of life, the, the joy we have in knowing that we are loved and redeemed and sanctified for a holy life. What does the Christian calling look like? Well, we go back to John. He was the closest disciple to Jesus. In fact, at the Lord's Supper, the last supper they had together, John's head was resting on Jesus' breast. There was a closeness, there was an intimacy. So John's testimony is very powerful. We have his gospel. Um, over the years, I've spent a lot of time looking at his gospel and spending time understanding what it is to walk in John's shoes, to be beside Jesus. I want to take you to something that he wrote later. He wrote to the early church, and we have his three epistles, letters. And I want to extract a little bit because John remembers Jesus' words, abide in me and I in you, where Jesus says in John 15, I'm the... I'm the vine, you are the branches. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so this reality is further taken into the understanding what our relationship is with each other, what our relationship is with God, and the caveats and the risk factors that can try to undermine it while we live in the flesh. My name is John Classic. Um, help pastor the churches here in Australia for the Church of God's Seventh Day, truly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the strength of the power and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. And today we're going to be reading from 1 John, beginning in um, chapter 2, where John writes, and he writes with his heart. He begins in chapter 2, verse 12, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. John knew what it was like to be forgiven. And he knows what it's, how encouraging and how empowering it is to be told your sins are forgiven. You are a new creation in Christ. He says, I'm writing to you, fathers people who've been around for a long time in the faith, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. So John is writing to the old and the young. He says, I write to you, young men, in halfway through verse 14, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Something very interesting about this. He recognizes God's good work in, within the community and he commends them for it. And as a young man reading to that, I used to be hungry to hear those words and I wanted those words. Some, some people respond to words of affirmation. We talk about the five love languages. Well, that's myself. And I read these words coming from John and they're very uplifting and encouraging. There's a lot of encouragement today in this message. John says, though, in a, talking about they have overcome the world, there's a word of warning. Do not love the world, in verse 15, or the things in the world. In other words, there are risk factors. The very fact that we live in a sinful, broken world with all of its physical prestige, power and wealth attractions can take, our way, take us away from the pure devotion to Christ. He says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So where is our heart and our mind focused? Where are our energy, time, talent and treasure? What do we do with all that we have? For all that is of the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. This physical earth, this cosmos will be replaced one day by a new heaven and a new earth. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. When I read today, listen very carefully to the word abides. We've already read it twice. twice. The word of God abides in you. And whoever does the will of God abides forever. That is, you are part of this. It's you. You are in Christ, and Christ is in you. His word abides in you. His spirit abides in you. In the covenantal relationship that you have with the Lord Jesus Christ, you abide in him. 
in the oneness and fellowship that just like Jesus abides in his Father and abides in his words and the Father abides in him. Children, in verse 18, it is the last hour and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. The first century leaders of the church expected Jesus to come into their come into their lifetime, to return in the might and the power and the glory in the kingdom of God. So he writes, it is the last hour. And you see that sentiment also echoed in Paul. In fact, this letter is written for us, I believe, more than it is was for the first century. John wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I believe he was a prophet in that sense, somebody who speaks God's words. And a prophet always speaks to the local audience, but in the duality there's a greater transcendent echo further downstream that speaks to the universality of all people. For example, in Revelation John, chapter 2 and chapter 3, John is sent with a letter and message from Jesus to those seven churches in Asia Minor, where Turkey is today. But when you read those letters for the first century churches, it's a letter for the church of Christ, Christodom today. You have the dead church, you have the loveless church, you have the church going through persecution. You have so many different churches there that basically typify Christianity today. The Revelation 2 and 3 is a letter for us. And John's epistle is a letter for us as well. Therefore, we know that it's the last hour. In fact, Jesus said before his return, it would be as in the days of Noah. People were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, living life as per normally, and knew not until the flood came and took them away. And that's going to be exactly the same when Jesus returns. Do you ever wonder why evangelism is so hard in this day and age? It was much easier when I was a boy. We were still a culturally Christian country. But those days have quickly evaporated for a more secularist, wokest, atheistic ideal. And our children are being taught that there is no God, that it's stupid and foolish to believe such. And that's the climate in which we evangelize today the days of Noah. Talking about the conflict in the church, as a result, they went out from us because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have been continued with us, but they went out that it might be plain they were not of us. In other words, within the faith community, you have people who come through the front door and exit through the back door. Some people exit quietly and go on to other pastures and we bless them and wish them all the best. But there are those who are imposters, those who are there for the feel-good moments, but not willing to suffer for Christ. And when the difficulty and the challenges come, they were never of us. So whatever happens in church life today, John understood it. It happened in his day. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. He's speaking to mature Christians, followers of Christ deeply immersed in the Word. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. John was dealing also with spurious gospels, the Gnostic gospel, so to speak. And what do we do today? If you watch some YouTube videos, you'll find all kinds of aberrations from the truth. No lie is of the truth. Jesus is the truth personified. He said, I am the truth. I felt for Pontius Pilate when he's standing before the personification of truth and he says in a very helpless, confused way, what is truth? Do you remember that moment? Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? So you can be all religious and not actually recognize that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God and the Son of Man who divested himself of his former glory, who holds the entire universe by the word of his power and entered our world in flesh and blood truly as the Son of Man to take away sin. And yet, you have people who deny it. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. We live in an Antichrist society, a post-Christian society, which is a, a very sad testament to where we've been, the wealth and the prosperity and the blessing and the peace that we've had, if I look at the repetitive nature of history, it's easy to surmise that perhaps all this will be taken from us unless we repent and we turn to God as a nation, as a people. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son 
has the Father also. This really speaks to the Sabbatarian churches of God where there are parts of the Sabbatarian community that honour the Father but dismiss or diminish the Son, deny his deity, deny his voice in Genesis. And that is very dangerous. It was dangerous as Paul outlined, as John outlined in the first century, and it's a dangerous path to deny the Son. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. They are one. That is an area of redress that we struggle with even in, 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 in this century. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. The truth you heard, the truth you heard from Christ. If you heard if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. That's why we're to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We are to eat the bread of life, symbolically to eat Christ, to live on him. Whoever eats this bread, says Jesus, will live forever. He says, I am the bread of life. Very powerful metaphoric language to know where we can draw our strength and our identity and our hope and to have eternal life only through Jesus. There's no other name under heaven by which men may be saved, said Peter, only in the name of Jesus. And John affirms it in his epistle. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24 when the disciples asked him about the signs of all the things that he said? He said, take heed that no one lead you astray. Or another translation, take heed that no one deceives you. And that can happen right within the Christian community. False narratives, accusations, deceptive slants. But the anointing that you have received in him, from him abides in you. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. The consecration to live a sanctified holy life. John is very complimentary. He recognizes the good work of the Spirit living in us. It's powerful to know that Christ abides in you and me by the virtue of his Spirit, that we can have the mind of God. I've been wrestling with the idea, as God tells the ancients, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But then that bridge is gapped. That, that gap is bridged by the virtue of the Holy Spirit, where we can have the mind of Christ and his Spirit dwells in us. So our heart and mind is not on the materialism around us, but on the heavenly glory that awaits to be revealed. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. You are faithful. You've been around for a long time. And yet John was a teacher. And he was referring to the fact that they are well-schooled in the gospel. But be careful, because there are risk factors. There are deceivers out there. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Like Paul says to those in Corinth, let him who thinks he stand take heed, lest he fall. Unless you abide in Jesus... And he in you, you will go off in some tangential narrative that's false and deceiving. And John was wrestling that. And now, little children, abide in him. This is John's message. You are nothing without Christ. Your identity is only in Jesus. And now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him at the shame of his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. You and I have been given the gift of righteousness. Now we need to live and bear the fruits of righteousness. Our faith manifest in godly deeds and self-sacrifice for the benefit of others. See what kind of the love the Father has in chapter 3 verse 1 has given to us so that we could be, should be called the children of God, and so we are? Do you know who your Heavenly Father is? Who your identity is? Why you exist? 
The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Even the religious leaders of the day did not recognize the Son of God and the Son of Man in their presence. They crucified him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Sometimes we read this out at a funeral. Knowing that the day of glory is coming and that Jesus is returning, and he's coming quickly at the appointed time of the Father, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. When Jesus comes, there's no need to feel ashamed or guilt or remorse. Great joy, great gladness for the culmination of every hope and aspiration will materialize at that moment when Jesus appears. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Now, many Christians say the law is done away with. We're under the new covenant. But Jesus speaks of those who proclaim Jesus, perform mighty miracles in his name, and apparently they did. And then Jesus says to them, get away from me. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Because when you read John, you hear Jesus' command to love one another and also a reference to commandments. The laws, the commandments of God, the righteousness of God manifest in moral behavior. Love of God, love of fellow man is as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago, as it was 3,500 years ago, as it was 6,000 years ago. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. That's a beautiful statement. And yet, Scripture says a righteous man falls down seven times but gets up. The habitual nature of sin controlling our narrative and our lives is no longer, has no longer power over us. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Remember the temptation that Jesus went through in Matthew chapter 4? There was a great contest. After Jesus was resurrected, he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Brothers and sisters, our victory is in Christ and in Christ alone. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. What do you, what do you make of God's seed? We go back to Abraham, and God promises that his seed would become like the sand of the seashore, like the stars in the sky. We see the seed of the house of David becoming the king of king and lord of lords. The seed of God is his Holy Spirit. When Mary conceived Jesus, it was by the Holy Spirit, not by a man, by his sperm or his seed. It was by the Holy Spirit. And John tells us that the seed of God abides in you and me. And he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. It's not your nature. It's not part of your narrative. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. John doesn't mince it. You're either children of God or you're a child of the devil. There's no grey in between there. John emphasizes that. It's very clear in his mind. And whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, he says, in verse 11, that we should love one another. And then John takes us right back to Genesis. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one. There was no, side, there was no question as to what side of alliance and identity Cain had. And murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Don't be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Cain hated Abel. Abel was righteous, known as righteous. And the spirit of Cain exists today 
in the malevolence and the denial against God and against his faithful followers. We must never be so naive as to think the nature of the spirit of Cain. What has Cain wanted to do? He wanted to kill his righteous brother. What is the spirit of adversary today against God? Want to persecute and kill those faithful people who carry the, the seed of God, the image of God, image of Christ, in their identity, in their vision, in their hope, and their narrative. Don't be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we've passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. That's what Jesus says. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Whoever does not love abides in death. So you either abide in Christ or you abide in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Jesus talked about what murder looks like. He said, you've heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, whoever hates his brother has already committed a murder in his heart. This is why love for one another, sacrificial love is so important to care for the needs of one another. Like Cain protested against God, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, we are. In a very deep and meaningful sense. By this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us. Exactly what Jesus said, no greater love is a man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. And you are my friends, says Jesus, if you do what I command you. So we take our word from the Lord Jesus. We take his words and eat them and live them. And that's our narrative. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Jesus was sacrificial love. And he invites you and I to understand what that means. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does the God's love abide in him? Like James says, you know, you have faith and I have works. I will show you my faith by my works, the things I do because I believe. Static faith is no faith. Even the demons believe and shudder, according to James's testimony. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. This is the synchronicity of all the authors of the scriptures. There are 66 books written over 1,500 years, about 40 authors. They all say the same thing. They speak of the same God. They speak of the same salvation. And they speak of what righteousness and truth and mercy and justice looks like. By this we know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. And sometimes we are feeling as if we're standing on a mountaintop. Other times we feel as if we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Don't trust your feelings. God is greater than our heart. And if he abides in us, our heart is elevated into the spiritual dimension of the transcendent, of the knowledge of what love looks like, of the knowledge of being loved and being able to approach the throne of grace because of the blood of Jesus to come before your heavenly Father. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. That's what Paul says. That we can boldly come before the throne of grace to ask for mercy and help in time of need. Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments in plural and do what pleases him. Long before the law was ratified in Sinai, we read of Abraham was faithful. He was a friend of God who kept God's commandments, statutes, laws and judgments. They existed before the Sinaitic Covenant. They're universal for all time. And this is the commandment, that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he commanded us. So Jesus' specific commandment is to love one another. And it sums up the ten words. Love of God in the first four commandments and love of each other in the other six. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God. The very moral nature of God lives in us, and you abide in God, and God in him. 
By this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. You can say, how do I know that I'm a new creation in Christ? Because of the Holy Spirit. You are completely transformed from the person you were into the person you are today. And your thoughts and your narrative in your mind and heart reflect a higher glory, a wisdom that's not your own. Very powerful and very encouraging. Our time is almost up today, but I want to be able to take a few more words out of chapter 4 as we begin to wrap up. John says in chapter 4, verse 4, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You know, for me personally, growing up in the faith, that was one of the most powerful messages to my heart, that no matter what we see and experience and are are persecuted and challenged in this world, the God we love, his seed in us, his spirit in us, is so much greater. Jesus has victory over Satan. It's only a matter of time before his demise. We drop down to verse 11. Beloved of chapter 4, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. John restates it because it's a truism and a reality that we could all never, never take lightly Never assume that we never assume that we fully know or understand, but by faith embrace this transcendent reality. Whoever confesses Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. That's why we are a Christ centered church. That's why my identity is only in Jesus. Because it's Jesus by his blood that ushers me into my Father's presence. It's a powerful and wonderful thought, woven together by testimony. Jesus prayed that we would believe on account of this man's testimony as well as his peers. So we've come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Do you know what it is to abide? to be identified by and as. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. I encourage you to again read sections of 1 John chapter 2, all of chapter 3, and into chapter 4. It's a lesson for the church today. It's a message for our hearts to encourage us to know where our identity is and where we put all our time, talent, energy, and resources to abide in Jesus and he in us. And by abiding in Jesus, we abide in God. It's perhaps one of the most liberating and encouraging messages that we could ever embrace. I hope on this Sabbath that you're encouraged and blessed. We live stream every second week, and we do we, we pre-record a featured sermon for the blessing and encouragement of our brothers and sisters right across this nation and beyond. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, on behalf of the Church of God's Seventh Day here in Australia, I'm your brother, John Classic. God bless you all.